Uh, good morning, everyone. So we are about to um, get started. We have here today Tracy Berry. Um, she is the Senior Competitive Strategy Manager at ServiceMax and also one of our customers. I had the pleasure of hearing Tracy um, present at SKIP, uh, which is um, a, a CI conference for, for competitive intelligence professionals, I think maybe two years ago now, Tracy. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. It yeah, was, uh, yeah, 2019? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was. It's like hard to remember the times. Um, everything feels like 25 years ago at this point. Yes. <laughs> 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 when we were able to travel. Uh, so I was able to hear a great presentation from her. Uh, Tracy has a wealth of knowledge. She spent her entire year or her entire career in, in intelligence and competitive intelligence and strategy um, previously with the, the NSA and the CIA. And then I believe after that, she kicked off um, a CI function at an insurance firm. And then more recently, I think, believe now is working at ServiceMax where she also launched their, their CI program and has some really great um, insights into what's worked for her. So thought that would be super valuable for um, all of our customers and for other people that are learning how to build their own competitive intelligence function. So thank you for being here, Tracy. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, no worries. And my name's Katie and I work on the marketing team here at Clue and sometimes end up hosting these webinars apparently as like my side gig. Uh, but I really enjoy doing it because there's a lot of really interesting learnings that are happening. So today what we're going to go through, I'll cover some of the um, just admin stuff before Tracy actually takes over the presentation. Uh, we will be recording this. So for anyone who missed it or for anyone that has to jump off early, we're gonna be sharing this out uh, via email later today. So you will be able to watch this recording. We have a chat box and we also have a Q and A box. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, bottom right is a Q&A box. If you want to type in any questions throughout the presentation, please do that. I'm going to be reviewing the questions and we're going to save them likely till the end for Tracy, but um, I'll help to, to read them all out to her as well. Um, feel free to use the chat function. It can be great to get to connect with other CI professionals um, if you want to sort of share information on who you are, where you're joining from, um, feel free to use the chat for commentary throughout the presentation. I'll primarily try to use the Q&A for reading questions. So um, put, put your questions in there. Um, there will be a couple of polls that happen throughout the presentation. So those should pop up. You'll be able to just select your um, responses and then we'll be able to share out the results from those uh, afterwards. So expect those. And I think in terms of the things that I needed to cover, that's it. Um, so without any further ado, Tracy, do you want to take it away? I sure will. Thank you. Um, let me just add, as far as the Q&A goes, um, if we don't get to your question during today's webinar, um, my contact information is at the end of this presentation. It's the last slide. So you can reach out to me directly if you'd like. And I'm always happy to talk CI. Um, great. So let's dive into this. Um, just so you know, here's the agenda. So I'm going to walk you through um, what I consider to be best practices in launching a competitive intelligence function um, where there has not been one before. But I think you could use this 30, 60, 90 day plan concept if you wanted to refresh your CI function or get it kickstarted again. Um, it's a great, it gives you tools and techniques to do that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the challenges and the opportunities in getting something going. And then we're going to go into that whole 30, 60, 90 day plan that we alluded to earlier and talk to you about some of the tools and techniques um, that are out there that can help you plan and execute on on your competitive intelligence function. And then finally, I'm gonna, um, this is all based on my experience um, um, most recently with ServiceMax. And so I'll just give you a little bit of like, where are we now, two years into it? Um, what have we done? What are our challenges and what are our opportunities? Okay, so we got our first poll. So question for everybody, why are you joining the webinar today? Are you new to CI? Are you thinking about starting a function? Are you launching a function? 
Um, do you need to refresh yours? Um, are you just curious or are you Tracy's biggest fan? You could answer that. I'm not allowed to vote, evidently. <laughs> But Katie, let me know and uh, looks like you've got a good number and we can. Yeah, it should be just about, usually give, you know, 10 seconds and then that should be it. We don't have to wait very long to get the majority of responses here. And then Matt can flip it over and show us the results. Great. Okay, great. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love that a lot of people want to refresh their, their um, CI efforts. So that's very cool. We've got some new people, got some people either thinking about or actually launching the function. Oh, and I've got some fans too. That's great. Okay, awesome. All right, let's get going then. Um, I think that there's a little bit of something for everyone in this presentation. So I'm excited. So let's look at some common CI challenges first. Uh, and this is CI challenges when you don't really have a, an official function, but you've got a need for competitive intelligence within your company. So a lot of times it ends up being a group effort, right? Like it's everybody's job and it's nobody's job. There's nobody held accountable or responsible for it, but everybody still needs that information. And then you've got the the FYI trap. I mean, how many times have you gotten inundated with an email thread, right, on something, whether it's competitive related or not? I mean, and then how do you go back and find that email and share that email and distribute that email? I mean, there's, there is all that, but there are often people who try to help, but sometimes it's just too much. And then content control. I think this was a huge issue at ServiceMax before we launched an official CI function, and that is that the information that could be had was out of date and it became incorrect, beca became not relevant, and it um, caused our sales force to lose faith in the competitive intelligence that was at their disposal because they knew it wasn't really something they could use. So when you're going to go about launching a CI function, one thing you have to get is executive buy-in, right? You've got to get somebody who's willing to commit to assigning an FTE, coughing up the salaries, benefits, everything for someone to come in and do competitive intelligence. So the way that, um, ServiceMax went about is they actually sent out a, a survey to their sales teams and said, what is it that you need to be more effective in your job? And of all the answers that came, that came back, it wasn't, I need a better commission structure, I need more customer profiles or industry profiles. The answer that came back very solidly was, I need competitive intelligence. So that was a first start in saying our sales forces recognize the need you know, let's move forward. Then the people that were doing CI ad hoc uh, within the company participated in some of the deal and business reviews with a competitive angle or competitive lens on and were able to contribute in some of those deal, uh, building out those deals. Then when you take just a little bit of competitive intelligence and show what's possible with it, how it can impact a deal, how it can change a go-to-market strategy. You show that art of the possible to people. And then finally, let data tell the story. If you've got a CRM with good win-loss data, for example, let that win-loss data guide you, guide your execs into helping to make a decision by seeing what competitive intelligence like win-loss can do for them. So when do you need CI resources? There are a lot of times you need CI resources, but I think one of them is when you're in a large and complex market and sometimes when it's really hard to differentiate on product. You know, oftentimes you've got different levels of experience within your sales team. Some of them are new, like in, in the case of ServiceMax even, some of our, um, the majority of our sales force is actually new. We've got a few old timers. So we've got some people who don't know field service, which is our domain at all. And you've got other people who can, you know, write the book on it. So with that, you've got varying levels of competitive intelligence that are needed. Sometimes if your brand is not 
um, a well-known one out there, you need competitive intelligence resources around branding. And then with emerging competitors, there's always somebody on your doorstep ready to take your place, right? And between emerging competitors and disruptive technologies, there's just two more reasons why you need resources to focus on competitive intelligence. And then finally, it's about hiring the right person to do competitive intelligence and finding the right fit. Um, this slide was actually originally created by the man who hired me. Um, and his, what he did in looking for someone to do the job was someone who, who not only can do it, but actually will do it you know, and having the attitude around that. Being naturally curious. I think anyone who practices competitive intelligence or knows someone who does probably knows that curiosity is like a, a key um, attribute of someone who is good at doing competitive intelligence. And then also being able to see the big picture and th think strategically. And then finally, the ability to engage at the front lines. It's all well and good to sit in your ivory castle and, and pound out reports every day about your competitors, but you really need to be able to go out there uh, and work with your sales force, with your execs, with everybody really at the front lines, uh, you know, kind of head to head against competitors. So um, I borrowed this um, chart on uh, program development for competitive intelligence from Fletcher CSI. They do a great webinar for SKIP, uh, the Strategic and Competitive Intelligence Professionals Organization. It's skip.org. If you're not familiar with them, you can check it out. But I like that this is a, kind of a, like a growth strategy for a competitive intelligence program. You know, at ServiceMax, it started out as a very reactive um, you know, kind of looking at this first column here, they had people doing competitive intelligence part time. There was no real budget. They just used, you know, Google searches to find information and competitor websites, things like that, as well as maybe some analyst reviews. Um, and it was really limited in what they could do. And then it transitioned. Um, once I was brought on to do it full time, I would say that we're now more proactive. We have a budget. We're using uh, resources, secondary resources. Um, we are able to do a lot more, even with just one person, a team of one. Um, and we are working across multiple business units within the company. Okay, now we're to poll two. Uh, the question is, what is your primary role in CI? You could throw that poll up there. Give you a few seconds to answer this. <laughs> I just just realized I spelled roll wrong on here. You can catch it. You win a roll. <laughs> Somebody spelled roll wrong. <laughs> oh, I will say we'll take that one, Tracy. You spelled roll wrong. We did it. <laughs> a bread roll. A CI roll. It's a new kind of sushi roll. <laughs> Okay, great. So survey says, oh, so you run CI at your company. That's a big one. That's great. I'm on the CI team. I manage the team. Big one for being a stakeholder or using CI. Super. I have no re role in CI and somebody's my biggest fan. That's great. Okay, super. Again, that just helps me in uh, knowing my audience here. All right, so now let's dive into hitting the ground running and uh, actually launching the competitive strategy function. I recommend, uh, and what has worked for me is building out a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Now you can Google 30, 60, 90 day plan and you can come up with a lot of frameworks and templates for um, using something like this. So I would recommend that. Mine's not the only one out there, but I think they all have basic same elements, you know, kind of evolving from the basics into operationalizing your plan. Um, so we're going to walk through mine, which is basically understand, evaluate, and optimize on your plan. So for me, when I uh, was hired on to ServiceMax, actually, I'll tell you, if you're looking for, um, for a new role, and one of those new roles is to help a company build out their CI function, think about putting something like this together as part of your interview process. That's what I did. I took to ServiceMax 
a 30, 60, 90 day plan for launching their competitive intelligence function. And I and showed them how we could do something with, you know, in, within a short time frame. And then I actually, once I was hired, I used the actual 30, 60, 90 day plan, obviously, to uh, build the function out. So the first 30 days that I was with Service Max, and that I think most people would be in a new company as you do that necessary stuff, right? I mean, you're training, you're onboarding. If you're new to the industry, then you've got to do a crash course in learning what the market's all about. And then any kind of internal training for us, we had a university um, and I did the coursework there. Then I think you really need to do some quick wins while you're gathering information and building out um, your template for what your launch, what your CI function is going to look like. For me, a quick win was doing a competitor profile. We had a competitor that within service, uh, the service max landscape that had recently really come on strong and service max didn't know a lot about it. So that was a quick win for me. Plus I got to learn a lot about the industry in the process of researching this uh, particular competitor. Uh, at the same time, um, I suggest you issue, initiate interviews with key stakeholders within the company. I did something called 30 and 30 interviews that I'm going to talk to you about here in a few slides. And then you start evangelizing CI. You'd be surprised how many people don't know what competitive intelligence is or what it really is comprised of. And when you come in and you're like, hey, I'm the new competitive strategy manager, they're like, great, what the heck does that mean? Gives you a great opportunity to open the door and start talking about CI. And then finally, you get to do some fun stuff too. Uh, in COVID, in the COVID environment, that's a little more difficult, but for me, I was able to do some site visits. I was able to sit in on some deal strategy calls. Um, and then again, going back to those informal discussions on CI that you can have with people at the water cooler, so to speak. So the next uh, 30 days was evaluating. And the first, one of the, key components of all this that helped drive the require identification of requirements for building out the function was done during these 30 and 30 interviews. Um, I met with over 30 people, 30-ish people for 30 minutes, and most of those discussions actually went into an hour, but talked to them about the status of competitive intelligence in the company, and I'm going to show you those exact, the actual questions I asked here in another slide. But also in these, in this next 30 days here, um, you need to map out the competitive intelligence or competitive strategy function, what it currently looks like, um, and then what are the priorities based on maybe fixing what's, what's not working. Then you need to look at the tools that are available to you, either internally or through third party resources and prioritize um, your use of those tools. And then finally, there are other activities to be done within those 30 to 60 days. Um, for me, it was actually giving a webinar and that competitor profile that I had done and also doing uh, some win loss review uh, at the end of a quarter. Okay, so here are these 30 and 30 interviews that I talked about. Um, I held them with key stakeholders throughout the company from the executive level on down, from the CEO actually on down, and I asked them all the same questions. What is your history of CI in the context of your role? And then what's working? What's confusing? What's broken? What's missing or what's on your wish list? And then if you could wave a magic wand, what would competitive intelligence look like to you? And then finally, I rounded that out with, you know, what are your preferences for consuming competitive intelligence and how often would you like to get your competitive intelligence delivered to you in different forms? So here, I'm gonna walk you through some of the results that we had. There was some good in what competitive intelligence was currently doing at the company. There were analyst reports. Um, we are on a magic quadrant with Gartner for field service management, so everybody always used that a lot. There were also other third-party vendor reports that included us and our competitors. There was a fair amount of competitive intelligence that was um, put into a repository on what we called our sales resource center. 
So it was good that it was there, but uh, as you'll see in a subsequent slide, it was kind of bad in that it was dated. We use Chatter. Salesforce, the platform, has, a ch has Chatter, which is a, uh, a great way to share information with people and hashtag you know, words so that you can search on them. Um, and Chatter was, was used probably predominantly as a CI tool in the company. CI session at kickoffs. Everybody rallied around and waited for the competitive uh, session during a sales kickoff meeting or company kickoff meeting every year. And the people who did uh, ad hoc requests for competitive intelligence would all scramble and put together profiles on competitors. And then those PowerPoint decks sat in a box folder somewhere and got stagnant and old and dated until next year when the next sales kickoff came around and it got dusted off and refreshed. And then finally, the people who were responsible for competitive intelligence uh, were accessible and they're always willing and able to answer questions and help people out and respond to their requests. So now more of the bad if that came out of those interviews Differentiation was a big one, um, and people felt like the differentiation that was given was not accurate, and it wasn't current. Like I talked about, currency was a big problem. Um, it never went beyond like feature function level. It didn't get into things like competitors differing go-to-market strategies or approaches to the market. Um, and it was very general in nature and not specific to each competitor. The big one really was decentralized competitive intelligence. Nobody knew where it was. Nobody knew how to get people to it. Um, the information was kind of pushed out, but there was no collaborative effort to pull information from people out in the field who have intelligence to share. There was no process for, like I said, from getting CI from sales, there was just a total lack of collaboration. And the only platform that we had, our CRM platform wasn't being used for, for the competitive piece at all. And then finally, the internal messaging, that's what we're telling people about competitors internally. It was outdated. There was a big disconnect between what marketing said and what sales was experiencing. So marketing tended to put like a slant, a very positive slant on our competitive differentiation, like rah, 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 we are the best at this. And it didn't really address what we knew were weaknesses because everybody has weaknesses. Um, at least I think so. And, um, and it didn't, sales couldn't relate to it because it's not what they were experiencing in the field. So there was a huge disconnect there and a lack of trust in the competitive intelligence that was floating out within the company as a result. Now there's some parts that got really ugly. <laughs> um, CI was only requested late in a sales deal. So, you know, it's really hard to scramble and get stuff at the 11th hour. Everybody knows that. Um, and then the information that was provided didn't lead to any kind of coherent strategy. Everything was done on an ad hoc basis. There were too many tools in that the content was everywhere and no one knew how to get to it. It wasn't searchable. Um, it was a real problem. And then the win-loss data, the data that could be used within our CRM was what I call dirty. It, um, and unreliable. And it was dirty in that none of the, com there were competitor fields in, in the CRM system, but none of them were required. So you could close a deal and not have to input any competitor data. And so you can only imagine as a result, if you ran a report looking for win-loss data, it wasn't very reliable because you had no notion of, of the, um, the volume that you were going to get. And then finally, um, people were really concerned within the company that um, ServiceMax was very reactive to the competitive landscape and that we really needed to be more proactive. We were doing too little too late.
So when <clears throat> I asked what's missing or your wish list, people wanted more CI. And they also wanted deeper analysis. They wanted a cadence. They wanted to hear about CI. Um, it needed to go beyond product to go to market strategies, et cetera. And then that central repository or one tool to serve them all, I call it. And then a lot of people wanted more around sales enablement, giving sales the tools to go out into the field and compete effectively. And I, I just listed some of them there. You can read them off. I won't read them all to you. Then we wanted to focus on customers and partners as well. Um, use partners um, to engage in more competitive information uh, and then also leverage our partners to show our strengths. Um, quarterly reviews with partners and then the big one that we still struggle with a little bit and I'm sure a lot of people do is we don't know what deals we aren't being invited to. That's a big one, isn't it? Um, you can, you know, you know when you win, you know when you lost but it's really frustrating when you see like a big press release from a competitor and they just won a big account and you're like, well, I didn't know about that account. You know, we never got invited to the party. And um, that, that's one of those things that's a really tough one to figure out, but that was on the wish list. And then finally, from a more strategic perspective, people that, you know, we didn't have any KPIs really. And there was, um, there was no access to the critical strategic meetings and reviews that were taking place from a competitive standpoint. Um, no one was in charge of strategy. We didn't really have strategy. And, um, you know, without strategy, you can't do things like early warning or anything like that. So a big disconnect there. And then finally, there was a real thirst for competitive intelligence that, like I've alluded to earlier, people wanted things on demand, you know, go and get the information, like battle cards and dashboards and things. They wanted newsletters of current activity going on. They wanted regular interviews and updates on the competitive landscape, quarterly win-loss and some partner information. And then finally, there were, there were some wish lists on um, being more engaged with sales enablement calls, wanting more competitor profiles and having them updated, et cetera. So out of the 30 and 30 interviews, I just showed you the good, the bad, and the ugly, but five key requirements came out from, I would say nearly every discussion held these five primary themes. And those were one, Focus on true differentiation. Um, remember, not just the feature function piece, but the truth behind strengths and weaknesses, competitors go to market strategies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then we needed a, a centralized location for the CI content. Then the big one, sugar-free messaging. Again, I alluded to this earlier. No more rah, rah, we're great messaging. Give us just the facts. Let us know where our strengths are. Let us know what our weaknesses are. Give us the landmines to set, you know, against our known strengths and give us the landmines to defend against our known weaknesses. Timely win-loss analysis and reviews was a really big one. Um, and you'll see how, uh, spoiler alert, you'll see how we built that out. And then more strategically, as, as I said before, we really wanted to be less reactive, more proactive, know enough about what's going on with our competitors to actually position ourselves proactively instead of just defending ourselves um, on a deal by deal basis. Okay, so within the 30 to 60 days, let's go back to this. We did the 30 and 30 interviews. So then what we wanted to do is map out the competitive strategy function. So what I did was I identified the key stakeholders, determined areas where it was critical for CI to be involved, um, create regular meetings to develop a cadence, discuss measurements for ROI, like how do you measure ROI for competitive intelligence? It's like the golden nugget, isn't it? That's a tough one. 
then I mapped the existing competitive information flow to see where, where problems were. And then finally, I had, um, we set expectations about what we could do within our budget constraints and, um, and within resource constraints, really, because remember, I'm a team of one. So really what I uncovered was that we had two primary audiences and you'll have to forgive my Harry Potter reference here, but I'm a Harry Potter nerd. I was just told this week I'm a nerd about Harry Potter. So there you go. I have it. You might, these, these pictures might resonate with you, but I think it's a great visual to show the difference between tactical and strategic audiences. So with tactical, you're looking at more your account execs, your product management, your inside sales, um, the solution engineers, which for us are the ones who build out our demos for prospects. And then you've got the more strategic piece looking at leadership um, and your partner alliance program and of course your board. So each of those audiences has different needs, right? In the tactical and short term, you've got sales enablement, you've got a centralized competitive intelligence um, portal. Um, and you've got timely communication and a demand for a cadence of sharing information. Whereas in the strategic's a little more long-term where you're, um, one of the big things that um, ServiceMax wanted to do was actually grow a culture of competitive intelligence in ServiceMax. I could probably do a whole webinar on what is a culture of CI, um, but that's, you know, being able to make each employee, your eyes and ears for everything competitive related. Um, going back to being proactive, already talked about that and also talked about win-loss analysis from a strategic perspective. I think it's really important, um, and you know, I, I discovered this in mapping out the function here at ServiceMax, is that it's really important for CI to be involved whenever there are new, new deals um, or potential new deals that are <clears throat> be, or that are in development whenever uh, a company is considering entering a new market or uh, yeah or a new taking on um, technology from an emergency uh, emerging technology and then also during any major strategic planning discussion I mean how many of us who are CI practitioners have been asked for competitive intelligence when a strategy is like half baked, right? <laughs> That's so frustrating. And the whole idea is to create this culture of CI where you're foremost at the beginning of the strategy planning sessions and not brought in towards the tail end. Again, I could do probably a webinar just on that. So meeting with key stakeholders, one thing that I did was I started meeting with each of our different regional teams on a rotation like most of them had weekly or bi-weekly meetings and i'd take turns dropping in on their different calls um, i started doing regular enablement webinars it's actually um, a formalized process at service at service max now so um, i get on the calendar regularly with some kind of cadence to talk about comp the competitive piece there um, i work with our sales advisory board and um, I'm actually the moderator for the board, so it's great insight into what's happening out in the field. Um, and then I just started, actually this morning, um, bi-weekly competitive intelligence office hours. And it was great. I had people drop in for a full hour and we talked about different things. I, it helps me keep my fingers on the pulse of what's happening out in the field. Um, and it gives them the opportunity to hear what's going on for me with competitive updates. And then on a more quarterly basis, um, we have, I have uh, a cadence of meetings with product management. Um, I go to all of the quarterly business reviews for each of the regions, EMEA, the US, and APAC. Um, I brief sales leadership and do executive briefings on a quarterly basis as well, providing material for our execs when they meet with the board. So we chose win loss, I chose win loss as an ROI measurement for competitive strategy. And why did I choose win loss? Well, it's a validated pain point, it's measurable, and it has high priority in the company. So 
I knew that if I could get some wins here, it would get a lot of traction. So the first thing I did was we identified some of the required win-loss data fields in our CRM, which is Salesforce, and then we revamped everything. We kind of gutted the competitor piece in Salesforce and rebuilt it, um, put in required fields. So people had to put information in on wins, on wins, on wins and losses. And um, then we educated the field on best practices. And it wasn't a one-time thing. We have um, a new hire training um, every few months. And I have a 90-minute competitive session with the new hires. And I always talk about Salesforce and win-loss in Salesforce and the best practices around it so that there's constant and there's constant education and refreshing with sales on why it's so important to have clean data in Salesforce. So then I actually tried to map out the flow of competitive intelligence. And this is, this is, you know, it's kind of sad really when you look at this because all the information with one or two exceptions is all flowing one way. <laughs> you can see it was flowing down from different elements or business units in the company through various different repositories and into a group of people, but it wasn't being shared back up, pushed back up. And so, yeah, no accountability, no way to capture CI from the field, and there was no mobile functionality, which um, turned out to be kind of a big deal. So what we did at this point was we set expectations about we, what we could do going forward. Of course, there are legal and ethical issues that you have to make people aware of. There was a lot of, uh, well, there wasn't a lot of no's. There was a lot of look what we can do. Um, and there was, and we never said no. If anything, we just said not now or stay tuned, it's in development. Um, and we tied expectations to the budget. Um, and um, I have to say, you know, from a budget perspective, there were, there were no's when we had asks, but then when we were able to justify certain projects or certain tools um, and show what we could get from them, um, leadership was forthcoming. So you have to be your own advocate, right? So then we looked at tools assessment. And from that, from that, I mean, we looked at all the different products and services that third party providers can, that they sell or provide to CI practitioners. And we realized that we needed something that would aggregate the news for us so that we didn't have to set up a bazillion Google alerts and try to stay on top of those. We needed some, something that monitor our competitors, helped us with win-loss analysis, looked at, at website updates and notified us when competitor web pages were updated. Um, and then something that would help create battle cards. And then some things that were more nice to have, things that we wanted to be able to do, uh, but weren't quite as much a priority was um, doing scenario planning or wargaming with our executive team and also having a third party provider monitor um, our competitors trade shows. So we ruled out those nice to haves. These were the five that we really needed to focus on. And we looked for a tool that would help us with these. And for us, it's probably no surprise that we found Clue. Um, Clue has been for us the central location for internal and external competitive intelligence. Um, I'm a, a rabid slash rabid fan of Clue. So um, I have to tell you that it's been, um, We've had super high adoption of Clue within our company. It is the place that everyone goes to for competitor information. It goes way beyond battle cards. I mean, battle cards are um, kind of the first step to uh, that everyone uses as entry into the rest of the data that we've built out in Clue. But, um, and the one thing I love about it and our AEs love about it is the mobile functionality. It's got a really slick uh, mobile app and um, it, we find that a large percentage of our people access it 
uh, through the mobile app. Okay, so now 60, 90 days. Uh, what are you gonna do? You're gonna optimize, right? You gathered all your information, you've mapped out the function, you've got some idea what's going on and where you wanna go. So for me, I started with engaging with sales. I actually went to boot camp uh, and that was a week long training. Um, I, I physically attended the QBRs that were held in London, which was huge because it got me in front of everyone as the um, competitive intelligence person. Um, and I participated in all of their deal reviews and it was just a great opportunity. And then I really started using chatter to engage with people uh, and get some collaboration going with the field. Created a budget, ran it by, got, got kind of my expectations set and set the expectations of the people who would give me the money around what we wanted to do um, for the year with competitive intelligence and what it was gonna cost to do it. Then I, we branded CI. So we actually worked with um, one of our designers in marketing, came up with a couple of logo ideas tested those with salespeople to see what resonated and then um, went forward and used, used the logos and um, developed uh, templates to be used in emails and newsletters and things like that. And the thing about branding that I think is so important is that when people see a logo, they immediately know it's competitive intelligence related, right? So that, that's kind of the idea behind the branding. It's not just kind of a nice to have, it's kind of a heads up, hey, if I see this, it's from Tracy and it's competitive intelligence and I need to read it. At least I hope that's what they think. Then um, we finalized some of our solutions providers like Clue and um, other third party providers we used for special projects. And then built a timeline. I wish I'd had shared the timeline with you. I didn't actually think to do that, but I actually built out a spreadsheet timeline for like a year out. And I put down all of the priorities and how we were going to fulfill those priorities month by month. Of course they were color coded and everything else, but it helped me frame up how long it was gonna to take to do some things. And again, it goes back to that setting expectations to help people understand how soon the competitive intelligence is gonna roll in based on uh, your timeline. When it came to budgeting, you know, we had to prioritize things obviously, and also look at things from a cost versus return on investment standpoint. And we came up with three priorities. Obviously that CI portal was number one. Special projects, um, there were actually some identified against specific competitors that we wanted to run. And then the win-loss, those were our priorities that we could do within the budgets we were given. And then those nice-to-haves um, are still kind of nice-to-haves. I mean, I've been able to attend conferences that are competitive intelligence related. I've been able to have training. Um, we haven't had trade show coverage um, and we're still looking on doing some more gaming with our executive team at some point. So what are some of the initiatives here with 45, with uh, 15 minutes left or so, I'm, it, we're almost done folks, but I just wanted to share with you some of the current initiatives that we have going on. The Intelligence Watch is a newsletter that comes out of Clue once a month um, and is curated by me. Um, news flashes are what we send out whenever something really exciting happens, like a competitor acquires another competitor or something like that. We send out a news flash with the facts uh, and then the so what, and then kind of like the now what, like what are we going to do? How do we respond? How do, you t how do you talk to your prospects? That sort of thing. We put out victory laps for every major win. Um, we debrief the whole team on the win, and then we share it with the company and celebrate together. And then we started doing that for renewals too. We had some, we've had some really big renewals from existing customers. And so if there's a competitive element to it, I do a debrief of the team and put out uh, like a renewal victory as well. We still use Chatter quite a bit. Um, it's great to have best practices in using hashtags and things like that so you can find data quickly. 
win-loss 2.0 I talked to you about where we revamped the fields. Well, well now we're going through 2.5. And just this week, actually, we're going to go live with a refined win-loss uh, data set in Salesforce. We just made it cleaner. We learned from doing, you know, we've, we've had about a year's worth of data that's clean now in Salesforce. And so we've used it to modify like our pick lists because we have pick lists for which competitors we won or lost against, what reasons we won or lost, um, that sort of thing. And so we just cleaned it up a little bit. Clue is, a, is just a constant build out and updating of information. And, um, and then special projects. We uh, have been taking on special projects against specific competitors. And uh, that's all I can say about that. So, okay, so the key takeaways today that I hope you got out of this, guys, is um, looking at, you know, what you need to do to get everyone on board with having a CI program. Uh, and then from there, using a 30, 60, 90 day plan to launch your function. Um, I think it brings, uh, it gives you focus, it holds you accountable for what you're doing, and it gives you a lot of opportunity as well. Uh, and I hope that I was able to demonstrate that during this presentation. Um, and then some of the techniques that you can use uh, in order to identify your organization's priorities around competitive intelligence and competitive strategy as well. So I promised I'd share with you where, where we are now. I mean, I'm two years in. I feel like in some ways I'm still <laughs> launching the function only in that there's always something new to do, right? For me, it's a constant build out of Clue. We've had great adoption, but with that comes responsibility. And I, But what I mean by that is that it's really incumbent on me to keep the data current, actionable, uh, useful, um, so that I keep driving people there and it's, it keeps being used as a tool. Um, as I said, we had, we've had four quarters of clean win-loss data in Salesforce, our CRM. So now we can just start to build trends in win-loss with those four quarters of data. Uh, for the longest time, I, I kept telling people two quarters does not a trend make. But now with four quarters, we can start to play with it a little bit more. The special projects that we um, committed resources to have yielded amazing actionable competitive intelligence. So uh, I definitely a win there on a proof of concept and uh, more special projects are in development now. Uh, I think that we've been able to demonstrate the value of competitive intelligence across the entire company and um, from the top down. Um, we've had great sales engagement. I was talking to Katie before uh, we started this call about our Tiger teams where we actually have subject matter experts uh, formed into teams against major competitors and those are different teams, different participants for each competitor. We have a cross-functional win-loss program. So not only do we use our CRM data, we um, actually use third-party providers to do interviews. And now we take all that data once we have it and we have a collaborative cross-functional win-loss team that meets every other month to review all that win-loss material and pull out the findings from it and use it as recommendations to leadership going forward to you know either change a go-to-market strategy or anything you know similar things like that um, and then um, on, on a more personal note competitive strategy has survived and thrived through four different managers in two different organizations doing during two major restructurings so in spite of being jostled around a little bit, CI has kept its focus and it hasn't really mattered where we've been placed, we've been able to stay effective and I think that's the most important thing. And then finally, there are some challenges and opportunities that have come up. Um, it's no secret that um, six months after I came on to ServiceMax, we were spun out at GE Digital and sold to a private equity firm. And within a few months, we had almost our entire C-suite replaced. So we have new engagement, and with that comes new opportunities. 
Um, also, because of that change in ownership, uh, I have to fight a little more for budget. We have a brand new sales force, so there's a lot of enablement around that. Um, and then there's always more opportunities to evangelize competitive strategy. We have a growing number of internal audiences, and by that I mean more and more business units are recognizing that they have a competitive card to play uh, and a need for competitive intelligence. Um, we are building out our partner and alliance program. And then just yesterday, there was a huge announcement that we have a brand new go-to-market strategy by partnering with what was a competitor and is now our best friend. So um, that, that has created like a huge opportunity slash a lot of work for me uh, in the coming weeks and months. So always something to do in competitive intelligence. Okay, so we're here on our last poll and I believe you can select all that apply, uh, but the question is what are your takeaways from today's webinar? So if you could take a moment to answer, again, you can select all that apply. Okay. What are the results? Great. I love it. I have clear direction on starting a CI function. That's good. Okay, the big ones were uh, I have a 30, 60, 90 day plan to help provide focus, accountability, and opportunity. There are techniques that help identify and prioritize my company's CI requirements. Okay, a few people need a bigger CI budget. So do I, by the way. Um, who knew Harry Potter was relevant to CI? And hey, look, I have more fans now, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Katie, so um, we've still got about eight, ten minutes. We can open it up to questions if there are any. We have tons of questions, Tracy. Okay. So, yeah, great. Right. Um, people are very excited about presentation and, and getting the deck afterwards as well. So um, one of the questions that we've received a couple of times, so I'll start with this one, is mm -hmm. about how do you keep the sales team engaged in providing feedback and competitive information? Um, do you ask open questions during sales team calls or follow up individually? Um, I think overall the question is, how do you get the sales people um, to actively contribute to Clue? Yeah, great question. And um, it is sometimes like pulling teeth. It's constantly um, being uh, in their faces slash top of mind. And it's through being yeah, active on their calls, asking open-ended questions, doing surveys, um, and building relationships. I have to, I mean, I definitely have my A team of people that I, that I go to, uh, and who come to me. Um, and I think also by doing these regular win loss debriefs, um, it helps stay engaged with the teams as well, uh, and gives you a sense for what's going on. Also, my office hours, like I said, I just started office hours, and today I had great session. Um, it went, it flew by. Um, people popped in and out, you know, they dropped on and off, but um, just getting a, 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 my fingers on the pulse of what's going on with the sales team right now with this new go-to-market strategy we just announced. So, yeah, just staying engaged. Uh, another question um, is, so victory laps are nice to celebrate and it's good to know that you did well, but do you also do this on the loss side where you share a loss for everybody to learn from or is this considered negative information? What are your thoughts on that? Great question. I do do loss debriefs for all major losses um, for late, late stage losses where I feel like we had skin in the game. Um, we debrief the team. They are shared in clue but they're not broadcast to the company. Gotcha. Um, you spoke about using win-loss as a means of measuring ROI. Mm -hmm. Did you attempt to quantify some of the strategic no-goes to the CI program? The strategic no-goes. Not sure I know what that means. 
Okay, we can, we can move forward. Um, another question that I actually had was about the sales advisory board. Mm -hmm. um, what does your sales advisory board look like and what's the primary purpose of it? Sure, so the sales advisory board has uh, 13 people on it, I believe. They rotate in membership, so anywhere from six months to a year, it will rotate. It's a like a cross section of everyone on our sales from inside sales, our account executives, our account managers who manage our existing accounts, not trying to sell to new logos, um, our solution engineers who are part of pre-sales doing all the demos. Um, and I think that covers everybody who's on it. Um, and they are kind of the ears and eyes for our chief revenue officer who is their sponsor um, they have their own special projects that they do um, they uh, when they got together at the beginning of the year and prioritized what they wanted to work on they meet with the cro once a month they review the project status with him they let him know what's going on in the minds of the salespeople. They have tough conversations. They're uh, with the CRO. I mean, it's not, you know, sit around and drink tea and talk niceties. I mean, there's some really hard hitting uh, issues that they deal with, but they are um, a great uh, influencer uh, on, you know, the, on what stays top of mind for our CRO. Um, speaking about sort of CROs, in your opinion, mm -hmm. what exec champion is the most important CRO, CMO, CFO? Um, <laughs> great question. <laughs> um, well, we don't have a chief strategy officer, unfortunately, otherwise I, I would name them. Um, I actually have moved around, as I alluded to, um, my most recent move was actually at my request. We never had a strategy function uh, outside of competitive strategy. No one really had strategy in their title when I joined the company, but I started seeing strategy formulated as a, like several people doing strategy under our CRO. So I asked to be moved there and I was. So I'd say for us, it's our CRO. Um, I think it may differ depending on the types of chief officers you have in your company, but um, I think the importance is, is that you find, you know, take it on yourself to find your sponsor if it hasn't been identified for you already. That's great. And then we had a couple of questions that are a little bit similar here about um, setting up a CI program with a limited budget or, you know, if you have a small team. So first question was, mm -hmm. how would you recommend a startup with a limited budget or limited resources to start a CI program? Okay, great. I mean, you don't, you can do it without any tools. It's harder, it's more challenging, but you can do it with Google Alerts. <laughs> I mean, you can, there, and there are tons of tools out there, templates, you name it. Um, there are great resources. Um, there's me, call me, I'll help you out. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, Skip is a great resource. Um, I would say, don't let a lack of budget stop you from doing it because it's very doable. It is. It's easier with some money. But, you know, a few quick wins without any money might get you a budget, might get, it, get you started. So don't let that deter you. There was a specific question in which... Um... Uh, like a small product marketing team is is adding CI as sort of a part of their work. And um, the, the person asking the question gave a couple of specific options that she wanted you to help think through. So, sure. Um, okay. They are, there are two product marketing managers, one user researcher, and they're basically 80% preoccupied with supporting product launches. So there's not really buy-in to add a full headcount for CI. Um, but all the pain points that you outlined were being felt. So the three options that are being thought about are number one, have one person on the team take uh, stay on part-time as like 40% of their role. B, try to have everyone on the team do a little bit. So 10 to 20% split the work up. Um, C, spend time building a case for full-time hire. Or D, hire an intern or someone junior as an internal transfer uh, to take a bit of it on. Do you have any experience or thoughts? I would that? say like a hybrid between C and D. Um, and 
I don't want to offend people in product marketing with what I'm about to say, but product marketing has a different skill set and a different um, outlook than a competitive intelligence practitioner should. Um, product marketing is meant to put the positive spin on things and to put the company in the best light for the most part. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's kind of how I see our product marketing. Um, and CI is more the doom and gloom. Um, this is how it really is. That, that should be their role, their job. So I would say rather than try and have somebody wear two hats <laughs> and two different, like, like Jekyll and Hyde almost, that you bring a, a, a different body in to do the work. Fair. Uh, one other question that's just about, how do you manage your time when doing CI? Oh my God. How do you manage your time? <laughs> um, it's all about prioritizing. It's all about prioritizing, list making, and if you need help in the prioritizing, it's kind of like what, what's going to have the biggest impact? You know, of the 10 different things you have on your plate, you know, what's, what's the most visible, what's going to have the most impact, um, things like that help me prioritize. I mean, I have a whiteboard on my desk. I have little room, but I have a whiteboard on my desk, and I'm constantly updating it with things I need to do, and it's more or less color-coded by priority, you know? So, How do you split up when it comes to splitting up um, the mm -hmm. tracking of different companies or competitors? How do you do that? One person is saying they're getting pressured to, to assign one person um, to watch one company and interested in your thoughts on that. If you have the luxury of doing that, go for it. I mean, if you've got, I mean, um, I think that there are arguments for and against that. Um, it sounds like you have a team of people and not many competitors. Um, so <laughs> no, she's saying she doesn't have that luxury. So. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually think um, multiple, I, I don't know anyone with a team big enough to just look at one competitor each, but um, I can see where like a laser focus could be really helpful, but I could also see where it could be a detractor. Um, I would almost think you'd want someone more well-rounded looking at multiple, like maybe all within one vertical and become a vertical specialist. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but, you know, single competitor, that's, that's a bit much. Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll ask maybe two more questions and then we'll, we'll sure. cut this off um, if you have the time. Yeah. One, uh, what can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by war games? I imagine not everyone's familiar. Sure. War games is also scenario planning or scenario analysis. And it's a really cool tool to use um, when you want to anticipate shifts in the market or shifts in the competitive landscape. It's kind of like a what if. So you build out um, scenarios. Uh, of what could happen in, in your market. And you put teams of people together and those teams represent different competitors. So let's say your Acme company, Acme has a team um, and then Acme's competitor A, B, C, and D each have a team. And you're all given a role to play in this scenario. Um, it's as if you're competing against each other and all of a sudden you have a control team also. And the control team will throw different uh, uh, wrenches in the spoke, so to speak. Like you're all out there just competing and then all of a sudden, like say you're in a heavy regulated environment. Well, they throw out, uh, they pose the question, uh, you know, the government just came out with this new regulation and it impacts your ability to, uh, I don't know, uh, sell your product into certain markets or something. How will you respond? So it's all about posing those heavy hitting what if questions. Like, all right. Or, you know, like next question, the control group might throw at you. Oh, look, these two companies are merging. Respond. Like, how would you respond if two companies 
two of your primary competitors merged? What would happen? It's, it's throwing like constant wrenches in the spoke. And by that, I mean throwing out the what ifs, whether they're realistic or not. I mean, I was just in a, uh, a class last month uh, and we uh, were going through a, a scenario planning exercise and I, and we were, it was around uh, grocery store delivery in the time of COVID and I threw out drones and everybody laughed and that became the joke was drones delivering groceries. Well, I don't know if you saw the announcement last week, but Amazon just got the uh, approval from the FAA to start delivering or testing delivery of packages. So drones is not, you know, it might sound like a sci-fi kind of crazy notion, but guess what? It's tomorrow's reality, you know? So it's testing how ultimately long-winded way of saying it's testing how your company could respond to changes in the marketplace. And it prepares you for being able to be nimble, right? <laughs> and pivot and respond to things that you weren't expecting at the end of the day. That's so. a good explanation. Uh, one more question, and the, there were two sort of about Clue, maybe you could give some insights into sure. uh, as a user. So one is Clue is obviously a part of your developed, your very developed CI strategy. Um, what type of lift is required to keep the data updated, credible, usable? Heavy lift. It is a heavy lift. It's a heavy res responsibility, like I said, and I take it very seriously because the last thing I want to hear ever is that the information I provide is old, outdated, not actionable. So I actually sometimes take my SMEs on different competitors and we go through and do a refresh. That's one way I go about doing it. Um, other times, um, I just mentally block out time to go in and make sure I stay, I'm staying on top of things. Anytime I see competitive intelligence about a certain competitor, I try and get that into clue right away because if you put it off, then you forget and then it's not there. So uh, it's being disciplined. Fair. Um, and then one final question. You mentioned that you use Clue for more than battle cards. Can you elaborate? And maybe Tracy, you could elaborate too. I remember in one of our previous webinars, you spoke about um, delivering more intel to CS teams and some new things that you were trying with that. Um, sure. Yeah. So um, we do have the battle cards and I have different battle cards for different functions. Like I have a battle card for our account executives. I have a battle card for our inside sales people. I've built out a couple of battle cards for our partner alliances team. Um, and, but the battle cards, if the battle cards are created from the content you put in Clue, but it's limited in the amount of content. It's limited in the amount of content that's in Clue that can end up on the battle card. So it's a long-winded way of saying there's a lot more you can put in Clue than just what shows up in a battle card. And that's what I was referring to. We've built out all sorts of content. Um, and if I, when I get that time, I've worked with my uh, Nate, who's my wonderkind uh, customer success person at Clue. Um, and he uh, has helped me uh, identify how to design my battle cards to get to more of that information in Clue. But otherwise, people can just go to what's called a board in Clue. And we've built out tons of content in there that isn't necessarily relevant to a battle card, but is super uh, useful uh, in competing against, you know, certain competitors in a deal, whether it's product information or like really detailed product weaknesses, things like that. So. Awesome. Uh, Great, yeah. Tracy. We can sort of stop there, but thanks again for your time today. I know that it was extremely valuable to, to everyone that would participate. Today. Sure. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Awesome. No problem. And thanks. And we'll follow up um, later today with presentation materials via email. Thanks all for attending.